This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. And if you could, please do me a favor and take a moment and leave a rating and review in whatever podcast player you're listening to this on, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Heart Radio. doesn't matter. I'd greatly appreciate it, and that feedback really helps get other listeners to the show. Also, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel so inclined, you can go to agutor.com slash tip and donate to the show. Thanks so much. All right, you leaders, today I'm honored to have Dr. Ken Boyer on the show. Uh, he's the author of a book called The Electric Vehicle Revolutions, uh, Five Visionary Leaders, or Five Visionaries Leading the Charge. Uh, he's also a professor at Ohio State University in the Fisher College of Business, and uh, so we have that in common, both uh, teaching, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, anyway, with all that being said, Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, John. It's a delight to be here. So if you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about your background um, and why you decided to write a book about EVs. I uh, have had the opportunity to teach and do research at Ohio State University. I've been here for this is my 17th year, but I've been doing this for going on over three decades. And I love supply chain. I've done a lot of research teaching about supply chain. I had the opportunity to do a sabbatical in Vietnam. A friend of mine was the founding provost for a brand new university in Hanoi. So my wife and I got to spend a month in Vietnam. Um, and always love cars and the process of making cars. So I fell into studying this company, VinFast, which is started by the richest man in Vietnam. Pham Ngoc Wong was born at the height of the Tet Offensive in 1968 in a country uh, destroyed by war, grew up dirt poor. He goes to Moscow to study and he graduates and he moves to Kiev starts a restaurant, then buys noodle-making equipment, builds a business that he sells to Nestle for $150 million. Goes back to Vietnam, builds a whole bunch of other business, businesses, Vin Group, Vin AI, Vin Phones, Vin Schools, Vin Mech, Vin Fast, starts a car company. And one estimate is that the Vin Group companies account for 2.5% of Vietnam's economy. Wow. So he's one of my visionaries, obviously. And links to two other visionaries. So he recruits, or somebody working for him recruits, Jim DeLuca, who was the head of all auto manufacturing for General Motors, retires in 2016, gets a call, and he gets talked into going to Vietnam to start a brand new car company. Uh, they built a plant in 18 months, start to finish, on what used to be ocean floor, oh 90 God. miles east of Hanoi. So... I find it to be a fascinating story. Uh, their company is making cars. They first made gas cars. Then in 2021, they switched and said, we're going to go all electric, which is either the dumbest or the smartest strategic decision ever made. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll know in five or 10 years. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that, that is crazy to, to build a factory that fast for starters. But also I love the fact that you're looking at the visionary uh, of someone who came from nothing, built something big, and is putting a lot of energy into new technology. You mentioned Vin AI. You talked about, um, you know, the like electric cars, which you know really have already kind of made their uh, huge impact in society today. I mean, my kids, uh, you know, granted, it may be like a, an edge case scenario since we've had you know only electric vehicles for the past several years. Uh, that, that's what they know. That's what they're used to. Is they're used to Teslas. They're not used to gas cars. And the fact that I don't think they've been to a gas station, you know, in three or four years. And so, so it's kind of like mind blowing when someone says, "Oh, we're going to QT to pick up something." They're like, what, "What's QT?" <laughs> they, they just don't. Right. They don't. They don't get it. Right. So you're 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 an interesting early adopter case. Yeah. Uh, in chapter two of my book, I talk about the gears of change. Unintended. You don't need as many gears in a lot of, in an electric car. Mm -hmm. But three things. Willingness to commit is essentially marketing. Who are you trying to convince? What are you trying to convince them of? How do you, you do it? So I talk a lot about that, how governments have built incentives, particularly in China. Uh, China's out ahead of the U.S. for electric cars. 
but we also have to have an ability to profit. Who's going to pay for things? Who's going to finance it? How's the money going to flow? And then you have to transform supply networks. You have to work partnerships across different boundaries, right? Um, so what we're facing right now in the electric vehicle revolution is people across the world are sort of evaluating, hey, do I need electric or does the gasoline work? My book does a lot of uh, backwards, forwards looks. So kind of a, a storytelling. And I believe firmly that human beings do some amazing things. People have great ideas all the time. But with every great idea, there's also some some flaws and we need to figure them out, right? Yeah. So, for example, Henry Ford, Thomas Alva Edison, and Harvey Firestone used to take road trips back in the late 1910s and into the 1920s. They had to carry their own gasoline because there were so few gasoline stations. In 1920, there was only one, ga there was, uh, one gasoline station for every 2,000 gas-powered cars in the United States. By 1930, it was one for 222, and the number of ga gasoline cars had exploded from 1920 to 1930. The gasoline station caught up to the cars. So we're facing some of the same thing today with uh, building out charging stations for electric cars. Yeah. They'll come, I think. It's a question of chicken and the egg. Which one comes first? Well, in this case, the electric cars came first, and the charging stations are going to come later, just like the gasoline stations. Yeah. And I think, I think for me, like I, I have somebody ask me probably at least once a month, like, well, how does it work on a long trip? How does it work on a road trip? And for us being on the East coast, it, it may be a little bit different than on the West coast. And on the West coast, they talk about long lines at charging stations at different places, because there are a lot of electric vehicles, a lot more, you know, per, per capita, I guess on the uh, West coast than the East coast. But I have not had an issue, you know, what whatsoever. And, you know, we, we go from you know, Charlotte, North Carolina, to the mountains and Asheville, up to, you know, Virginia Beach, down to Florida. I have never had, you know, any complaints or issues. We take it camping uh, a couple times a year. Never seem to have a problem. We can always find a place uh, somewhere. And you just have to schedule your trips and plan a little bit differently. Like, you know, we always make sure we leave so that in a couple hours we're going to stop for lunch and we'll just plug in, go grab lunch. By the time we finish eating lunch, it's usually time to hop off the charger and continue the trip. And there are stops that we would have made with our kids anyway. It's, it just doesn't really change anything for me. Uh, right. That's, and that's what I like to talk to people is you have biological needs, right? So you have to start some kind of schedule. Uh, I've had a Tesla for five years and uh, summer 2021, I lived in Ohio. Um, my mother soon to be 90 years old. I need, I wanted to go visit her. And actually, I think this was summer 2020 and I wasn't going to get an airplane. So I drove all the way to Florida, 1100 miles. It worked. I just had to plan on stops. Interestingly, at, at that time with COVID, one of my problems is I couldn't get into the bathroom because all the restaurants <laughs> weren't letting people in. Yeah, that definitely makes it a little bit more challenging. But uh, but yeah, it just it just seems to work. And and you know, I, I think one of the things you talk about is you know transforming the supply network. And I think that's been in the news and, and something that I hear about a little a little bit more and more about difficulty of getting parts. And I had my own experience with that not too terribly long ago where um, I got rear-ended in a hit and run accident. And it was just kind of a, a freak thing where I had just gotten my Model Y. It was, you know, four months old, three or four months old. And someone rear-ended me. Didn't do a whole lot of damage, but it did, you know, some in, in key areas of the vehicle. And apparently just getting parts for a Tesla. I don't know if it's just Teslas or if it's all EVs or whatever. It was so challenging. And, uh, I, I think my car was in the, was in, um, the shop for eight months and two days before I got it back. And it was literally just the back bumper and the, uh, fender, you know, but because of getting parts and the fact they had to take things apart and there were little clips they needed that they couldn't get. And, you know, they had to drain the battery all the way down before they allowed to work on it because of Tesla's like, uh, I guess certified process or something. It was just a pain. Well, and, and I guess it, that needs to be fixed. You know, it's an point that you bring up, John, because uh, obviously Elon Musk is one of my other visionaries. So yes. we have to get through <laughs> all, all five of them. Uh, and the chapter title of the book is The Rise and Evolution of Musk Love. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, he's clearly changed the world. He's the prototype. He, he and Tesla have shown that electric vehicles work, but they also very tightly control their supply chain. They, mm -hmm. they are pretty vertically integrated. They have a lot of tight controls. They had to because they had to show that electric cars will work. My guess is that things will improve as we get more electric cars on the road. Uh, you know, think about gasoline cars. Um, 
they are becoming very much computers. But if you go back 20, 30, 40 years, we've got all kinds of junkyard shops and parts shops mm -hmm. and places to fix gasoline cars. Uh, when there's more electric cars on the road, there's there'll be more people willing to work on them and uh, provide parts and stuff outside of perhaps Tesla's control or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And uh, well, well, let's talk a little bit about some of the you know, companies that may have transitioned from, because you know, Tesla started only as electric and kind of, you know, put all their eggs in that one basket. But there's other vehicles, you know, manufacturers like GM that transitioned from gas to electric. And is, can we talk a little bit about what that was like or how that's like and how, how that's working for them? You know, Ford obviously w was pretty innovative with their F-150 Lightning, but then you got, you know, GM with the Hummer EV and the Hummer SUV, which showed you that, you know, you could have big vehicles that are electric, that are off-road, that are, you know, truly, uh, you know, rugged. Right. And it, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger shows up in my book several times. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, he drove, was one of the first drivers of the first Hummer mm -hmm. back in 1992. He was also one of the first drivers of the Tesla Roadster in 2006 or seven. Uh, there's a, a, a picture with him driving um, the Roadster with J.B. Straubel, who's one of the five co-founders of Tesla. And, and a lot of people don't realize it, it wasn't Musk only. There were four others that had to sue Musk to be named the co-founders. He brought in the money and he kept putting, and, and he was very well to be committed. He bet dollars and that's what's made him the richest man in the world, but it wasn't him alone. So Arnold has shown up multiple times, um, and they're bringing the, the electric Hummer. It, it was interesting that over last football weekend, the first NFL weekend of the year, uh, GM was advertising the Hummer quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> which to me indicates that they think they can sell it because it's a cool vehicle and it's attractive to a lot of people. General Motors is trying to go electric. Mary Barr. The, the first female CEO is another of, of a major car company, is another one of my visionaries, started turning General Motors towards electric 10 years ago, as early as 2014, 2015. The challenge is she, they're a publicly traded company worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Investors want to see their money make more money. And so General Motors is struggling with finding a mass market for cars. Now, Part of what's happened over the last year is the electric vehicle revolution has slowed down. And there's a lot of reporting that is misreporting. Electric car sales are still growing faster than gasoline car sales. They're just not growing at a 50% a year clip. It's not going to be an easy revolution. So Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, I think it was about eight months ago, announced, hey, we've got a skunk works in California working on making a very low cost car. Flash that to Henry Ford, who made us where we are today by offering the Model T. So it, the the legacy car manufacturers, the Fords, the General Motors, the Stellantis, the Hondas. Uh, I have a chapter about Honda in there, too, titled The Nervous Giant. Why is Honda a nervous giant? Well, they have the biggest gasoline engine production plant in the world in, in Ohio, about 70 miles northwest of my ha house. If And they are also uh, one of the companies where the term poor competence was was um, coined. So Honda came to the U.S. by building motorcycles. They were the world's biggest motorcycle manufacturer. They came and built a motorcycle plant in Ohio in 1977, then an automobile assembly plant. The Honda Accord became the best-selling car in America, and, and they are poor competent with engines, gasoline engines. Well, that's going to make you nervous because now you got to figure out a new um, competence, right? I, I had coffee last week with a, a business colleague whose son just graduated from Ohio State's College of Engineering, and he's working on the new battery plant that is 40 miles south of my house where Honda's investing $2 billion. And they're building it out. And meanwhile, they're sending this young man around the world to study battery production, to meet with experts, to learn, to innovate. I wouldn't count Honda out of the equation. I wouldn't count General Motors out of the equation. Uh, there, there's a lot of game to be played. We're, we're in the, the late, maybe the somewhere in the first quarter of this 
uh, football game of a transition to electric cars. Yeah. So um, we've already, you know, somehow hit on three of the visionaries in your book. Who are the other two? Uh, I think we've actually hit on four. The Luca, right. uh, yeah. Okay. Four. Nuri Barra, if I'm not wrong, Elon Musk, Rob Hansen. Not another okay. um, story I'd love to tell. Yeah. Rob, Rob Hansen and P. Johnson uh, met in graduate school at Stanford and they caught the Silicon Valley uh, startup bug. So they were working for a solar power company. And they were like, okay, we make good lily. This is not what we want to do. We want to change the world. We want to do something that's cleaner and greener for the environment. Um, and ideally, uh, that helps people out and maybe makes us some money. So they worked nights and they did their research. And they eventually came across Laurent Foulchery, who is a professor at the Ecole de Mines Paris, which is not in Paris. It's actually in Cannes. <laughs> okay. Um, but he published a paper in 1995 saying we can make carbon black, which is essentially soot from natural gas, and it will be clear. So carbon black, for those who don't know, makes up 30% of the weight of every automobile tire on the planet. It goes into mascara, paint, uh, all the black tubing in your car. It goes into all kinds of things. It is one of those ingredients that makes the world go round that a lot of people don't know about. Right now, it's made by burning petroleum, essentially. Very bad for the atmosphere. Well, so Rob Hansen and Pete Johnston found Professor Fulshuri, who said theoretically you can do it. By the time they found him, they go to his lab and they and he says, "Do you want to see how he, how we do it?" And and according to, to Rob, you know most scientists will show you a whiteboard and say, "Here's the experiment we did, and here are the results and stuff." Full Sherry walks into the corner of his lab and has this little machine. He starts turning dials, blah, 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 and out comes carbon black on one side. Okay, so this was 13, 14 years ago. Then they scaled it up. So they built a pilot plant in California, uh, worked it for a few years. Then they moved to Nebraska, built a larger production plant that they've been running for several years, and they're working towards, to get a sense that they've been announced soon, they're going to expand to uh, their full-scale plant, Olive Creek 2, which will be 12 times the size they are now. Okay? And, and what I left out is the economics. By making carbon black from natural gas, it splits it. Uh, the natural gas can be split into carbon black and either hydrogen, which can be used for power generation, or ammonia, which can be used to fertilize crops. One of the reasons they located in Nebraska is, guess what? A lot of people growing corn in Nebraska that can be consumers of the ammonia that they make. Win-win. So that that's my fifth vi visionary. The company they founded is Monolith Materials. I'm not sure I mentioned that. Um, entire chapter in my book called Tires, Tires Everywhere. Because another problem people don't realize is what happens to tires at the end of life. Uh, the, the, the challenge is they go to landfills. And often those uh, uh, landfills uh, catch on fire. The sheet, I think it was in Kuwait, I may be off on where it was, has the largest landfill in the world. Set it on fire to get rid of some of the tires. You could see the smoke from space. Oh my God. Not good. Right? See, I just don't so, turn into swings. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so there's another company in my book uh, that gets a little bit of a discussion. Service Solutions is trying to upcycle and take the materials from tires and turn it back into virgin materials that can be put into new tires. Um, in my power sources chapter, I talk about batteries, but also renewable power, solar, wind, uh, hydro, nuclear, and the need to develop a circular economy. There are opportunities for new businesses, definitely around what many people call the energy transition. Renewables are actually cheaper, in far cheaper in most cases, if you're installing them instead of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities to be creative and build that into, and again, back to the gears of change, trans transforming the supply network. Um, for example, putting solar panels on top of restaurants or uh, stores or whatever. Yeah, I just heard about that in the news that somebody was leasing roof space uh, to build to put solar panels on there to pump that money back and or that energy back into the power grid. 
Yeah, yeah, and and, and there are huge opportunities. And again, in, in my book, in electric, the electric vehicle revolution, with the one with visionaries because they're too old. Um, uh, there are opportunities here, but one of the challenges is renewable. We can't control exactly how it works, so we need battery storage. And so lithium ion batteries are are one example. There are many other. There are thousands and thousands of people working on better battery storage around the world. I think we'll figure it out. Um, so let me briefly tell you the story of John Bannister. Good to know. Okay. Uh, I came, get, came across him in the part reading my book, and I, I was reading something about batteries, and it, it said, everybody knows about Professor Goodenow. And I'm like, I don't. <laughs> so I, I went and did a little research. Fascinating story. He studied and earned his PhD in physics under Enrico Fermi who was the inventor of the first nuclear reactor in Chicago, at the University of Chicago. So he studied under a pretty smart guy. Okay. Professor Goodenow, and by the way, it's spelled good enough. I think it's pronounced good no, but it's good enough. <laughs> went to Oxford University in England, and he was one of the people who figured out how to double the power storage ability of a lithium-ion battery in about 1980, 81, 82. He was awarded the Nobel Prize with two other people that helped advance lithium-ion batteries in 2019. He was the oldest winner of a Nobel Prize. Do you think he was good enough? <laughs> more than more than more than enough. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, unfortunately for the world, he passed away a year year or so ago at the age of one one hundred and one. Wow. But uh, again, kind of the the point of my story is we figure stuff out. People come up with an innovation, and sometimes it's got some downsides. But then somebody else comes along and figures out how to mitigate those or something like that. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the battery storage and the dilemma that we're running into now, because I, I've heard things, and I don't know all the details about this, um, but that w one of the problems that we have with batteries is they degrade over time, right? And then what do we do with them? Like, wh where do they go? Can they be recycled? Do you, what's the pr proper way to get rid of them? And and what about all the, you know, problems with creating the minerals to create new batteries? That That is a key point, John. Uh, again, across the world, I think, ideally, we need much more circular supply chains. Um, yes. So as we talk about batteries, a couple of things. What happens as a battery degrades? It's it's exactly like your your cell phone. Is it loses power, and at a certain point, it doesn't have enough power to get you through a day or even a morning. So as a consumer, you might say, okay, I'm going to do a cell phone. Well, with cars, uh, with car batteries, one thing you can do is what's called a second life battery. So there are all kinds of applications. There's one in Rotterdam, Netherlands, of a stadium where they took 500 Nissan Leaf batteries Pull them out of the cars, put them in a rack, and it captures energy from solar to store so that the stadium can turn on lights and everything at night. Okay, so you can do a second use battery because it doesn't matter if the battery's only got 50% of its original range. At the end of life, there are many companies jockeying for position to recycle the batteries. So one of them is Service Solutions, which has a facility in Lancaster, Ohio which is about 50 miles southeast of my house. They have a $90 million grant from the Department of Energy to help build out their facility to recycle car batteries. They're, they're going to invest half a billion dollars. How, how do you go about re recycling a car battery? Like, is, is it taking the minerals out that were used before and then kind of re 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 revamping them? Or yeah, I don't know. No, I, 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 I have kind of a third grade understanding of it. Uh, there are multiple methods of doing it. It's called a hydrometallurgical process okay. that turns the, the battery cells into what's called black mass. And then there's other steps to process them into their raw ingredients, manganese, gotcha. cobalt, lithium, and so on. Um, it, 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 it's, it's possible to do because the, the materials are, are valuable. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we can do it. Uh, interesting thing is where do we get this stuff? There's a, another interesting book, The War Below by Ernest Scheider, talks about the challenges of mining the lithium and the materials we need for car batteries. And what a lot of people don't realize is almost everything in modern society comes out of the ground, either from a mine or we grow it to eat it and, and do something with it, right? And 
Mines are dirty, but they can be done better, right? So the 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 only lithium mine that's uh, being built to, and opened in the U.S. is Thacker Pass in Nevada, in which there was a long battle over uh, a flower called Buckwheat's uh, TM, and and some environmentalists were fighting hard to save this flower, which you know I, I think is a good idea up to a point. At the same time, we have to consider what choices we want to make. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, they were given approvals. Uh, the, the The mining company tried to grow the flower in in artificial conditions, in like greenhouse and stuff. They never could quite figure out how to do it. Uh, so th- they finally got approval. They're being very careful around where this flower grows. They're watering the flower. They're cleaning up. They're spending millions of dollars to protect this flower while also seeking to mine lithium that we need. So, uh, again, we have to make, we have to make some choices, right? Um, we have time. I'll tell you one more story. Yeah. Uh, yeah go for it. Of Ma- Marcus Samuel. Do you know who Marcus Samuel was? Yeah. Most people don't. You know who John Rockefeller was? Absolutely. Yeah. I watched the show, uh, uh, the man who built America, right? I mean, the man who built America. Exactly. Yeah. Marcus Samuel was the son of a seashell merchant in London. He built up a trading business. And if that's all he did, we might not have ever heard of him. But he also went to Azerbaijan in 1888 and stood at the Baku oil fields, which produced so much oil. I think it was 20 million barrels a day. Mm. They didn't even know how to cap the wells at that point. So there was just this lake of oil. At the time, John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil had a monopoly. They had reached a deal with the Rothschilds, the rich bankers of Europe, that they could take oil to Asia in a certain amount. And they were taking small little tins, like three inches long. Think of what tuna comes in, in a wooden ship. Anybody can now connect the dots to where we're going with this. Marcus Samuel built the first viable oil tanker, the Murex, named after a shell. He hired a company to design it, put all kinds of safeguards in it, his genius was he hired a man, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, who had a seat on the board of Lloyd's of London. So that when it went to the Lloyd's of London and they said, is this ship safe to go through the Suez Canal? The answer was yes. Right? Marcus Samuel was one of the two founders of Shell Oil Company. Ah, now you should get the connection, right? So Marcus Samuel made a lot of money. Now, ironically... He got a night of it because two years after the Murex was launched, the British Navy had a battleship go uh, get stuck on a sand drift in the Suez Canal, and this oil tanker came along and pulled it off. How embarrassing for the, the Royal Navy. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's super fascinating. Um, I, I had no idea that's where Shell Oil, the name came from. That, yeah. What do you see? Yeah. Not now, now you and your listeners have learned something today. <laughs> I think we've learned a lot. So, um, where where is this electric vehicle revolution going? Like, wh- where where can we see things going in the next decade or so? Well, I, that's kind of the open question. It, and and this election that we're, the United States is having at in November ha- is going to have a lot of bearing on this. But let me put a couple pins in the map. Hmm? China is selling roughly 50% of the cars bought there are electric right now. Norway this year is projected to be 90%. So one of the things is, uh, I have a friend on Facebook is doing a 40 album in 40 day challenge. And ironically this morning he posted AHA's album. And for Gen Xers who know AHA, that immediately uh, brings a song to the mind. But the lead singer for AHA, whose name I don't remember, led a crusade and sit-ins and stuff in the early 90s in Norway, they say, we need to go electric. He built his own electric car 30 years ago. Wow. So I, I talk about that in my book. Uh, it, it, Norway has 90% of its cars are electric. So when people say, oh, they won't work in the cold, Norway's cold. Yeah, I, I actually just got back from Norway, went there uh, in June, and yeah, every taxi we, we rode in was an EV, every single one of them. Um and I think there were mostly Teslas too, but I mean, there were EVs everywhere. Um, the hotels we stayed at had charging, every parking spot had a charging port where you just plug in at the hotel. Um, yeah, EVs were everywhere. I think 
on the entire trip, we were at Norway, Denmark, Sweden, lo- lots of little countries. And uh, I-, I don't think we rode in a gas powered car the entire time we were we were over in Scandinavia. Right, right. A great example. And, and so, so two points. I, I don't want to lose the first one, which is where's the electric vehicle revolution going? Yeah. Depending on what happens in Europe or the U.S., it, it may stutter and 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 not go to full fruition. But the Chinese are coming. The Chinese are coming. There's so much capacity in China. The, those cars, they're going to go electric and they're going to wash over the world. Full stop. Um, and, and that reminds me of another point. I want to go back to willingness to commit. Uh, mm-hmm. How do we turn that in gear to get people to go electric? Well, the first thing is you're not buying an electric car to save the environment. You're buying it because it's a better car. It's quieter. It accelerates sinister. It should need lower maintenance. Now, your earlier example of Tesla is a good one. There are situations where things go wrong because we're in the first 10 years of the electric vehicle revolution. We haven't had 100 years to perfect this like we have with gasoline cars. But again, full stop, the cars are better. Yeah. The, the main existing barrier right now is cost. When car companies start offering affordable cars, people are going to switch. You know, so so let me go back to VinFast. VinFast developed cars. They had a rough entry to America. They they got Biden to tweet about a plan to plant in North Carolina. Uh, I think it was three years ago now. But their cars came, their luxury and cars came to America and got horrible reviews. Okay, so they're in a little retreat in America. But meanwhile, they're they're, they're moving to Indonesia. They're they're moving to India. They're they're trying to sell cars there and build <laughs> other plants. But they have a car, the VF3, that they promise that they can sell for, uh, I think it's $15,000. Holy cow. And yeah, America, we have a lot of very big trucks, but there's a market for a low priced car. Mm-hmm. And if somebody can make an electric car that has, uh, it, that is reliable and good and affordable, at some point, there's going to be a, a, a huge change in what people are, are buying and, and who leads the market. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you definitely have to get that innovate battery innovation so that you have, um, a lower or, or longer range too, because BMW had the, I think it was the i3 that was a uh, 90 mile range. It was a lower cost vehicle. It didn't quite do as well as they hoped, but mainly because that range, people couldn't get over the only 90 miles of range. So, Yeah. And and, and, that, and that's fair. I mean, human beings were, were, were thinking animals, right? Yep. And so psychology is important. Um, Right now, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in hybrids or plug-in hybrids. Uh, I think a plug-in hybrid is insane. As a recovering engineer, I have a mechanical engineering degree. I worked on a nuclear submarine for a year. Uh, having two power plants is unnecessary. Uh, but it, it it calms people's fears. So the idea of a plug-in hybrid is if you have a battery that will cover 50 to 70 miles... That covers your needs like 95% of the days. Mm-hmm. But when you take a road trip out of town or go camping or something, it feels good to have that gas engine. Well, I, I, again, I think it's it's a matter of letting people experiment and become comfortable with it. When, when I got my Tesla five and a half years ago, all my kids and my wife they had a little internal bet going, how long before Ken ran out of power? Knock on wood, nobody's collected yet. Yeah, no, I have to say range anxiety was definitely something that we had at first. Um, you know, especially, especially I remember my wife got her uh, first Tesla, I think in 2019, and we went to um, Asheville for a camping trip. And we were so nervous on the trip. Like, is it going to be able to charge enough, at, you know, at the house? Will we get there, you know, get 1% per hour or whatever plugged in, you know, to 120? Is it, is it we're going to find chargers along the way? And we had no problems. And after that trip, I think our range anxiety just almost dropped to nothing to where now we've, you know, it's going to work out. Like we don't even have to worry about it. It's, you know, the math kind of calculates in our head automatically like, oh, we'll get there at 20%. By the next morning, we'll have 40. We'll be good to go. You know. Right. Well, it's the same necessity as the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm a pretty smart guy. I get paid to teach and do research for a living, but I do some massively stupid things. That road trip I took to my mother's house uh, four years ago. Yeah. I forgot. I forgot to bring my, uh. 
uh, plug, my uh, adapter fit. Oh, your mobile fit. charger? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I had one of it and then I had to, so I, I had to do this dance of running around where my mom lives in Florida to find the place that I could charge it. it. I did, but I, the whole 10 days I was down there, I'm like, you're an idiot. You should have brought that adapter, right? Uh, but again, for your listeners, um, one of the things that's really cool about electric cars is, and it takes a while to sort of learn and get comfortable with this, is I do 95% of my church again at home. And it's simple. I get out of my car. It takes me maybe 10 to 15 seconds to plug in. And then when I go to get in the car, it takes me 10 to 15 seconds to to plug out. And there's no nasty gas fumes. And it's literally, I just reach to the side of my garage and I plug it in. Easy peasy. Yeah, absolutely. Not only that, like when you do go camping, a lot of people are concerned, oh, you know, it's what are you going to do when you're camping and you're out in the woods? Well, most campsites have, you know, hookups for, uh, you know, campers and they have, you know, 240 volt connections. You just buy an adapter and you plug up and you charge, you know, relatively fast there. Yeah. That's like good level two charger right there built into the camp campsite uh, that you can top off at. And most, um, at least on the East coast, but most of our campgrounds will let you do that for free. You know, just go plug in. Right. And, and you bring up another thing. Uh, yeah, I don't explicitly address that in my power sources chapter, but there's lots of opportunities as we build out this energy transition for, uh, vehicle to grid, and so on. Uh, I saw something last week, a paper I was reading, that it can be worth when in California or Texas, when the grid is overburdened, uh, something like 40 to to $100 per event for people who have like a, 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 power, a Tesla power charger, and Ford's making similar things, GM is making similar things, there, there's going to be a lot of choices for this stuff to feed back into the grid. Right. Um, and again, you know, as as an engineer, I, I'm very optimistic. I think we can build our way out of a lot of things. So going back to monolith materials that I've talked about, one of the really cool things is the reason their carbon black is so much better for the environment is because they're heating the natural gas with electricity and they use electricity for renewable power to get their process to work they needed a 16 megawatt arc reactor the biggest in the world was one megawatt well guess what you get a team of really good engineers together it's like going from a 100 foot bridge to 1600 foot bridge we know how to build the 100 foot bridge if we know how to make a one megawatt arc reactor we can make a 16 megawatt one we just have to put a bunch of smart people on it and, and engineer it, which is exactly what monolith materials has done. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, Ken, this has been a great conversation. I think I've learned a lot, and the stories uh, about the five visionaries have been really insightful and entertaining, uh, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. How can people connect with you online, learn more about uh, this whole electronic vehicle revolution, and pick up a copy of your book? Well, so a couple couple ways is you can just Google Electric Vehicle Revolution, Five Visionaries. Find it on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, some bookseller. You can also go to my website, www.gearschange.com, or just type in Ken Boyer, Ohio State. Um, unless you're a Michigan fan, in which case, <laughs> no way. I hear you. All right. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for coming to the show. Really appreciate it. And I'll put those links in the show notes too at geekleader.com so people can click through and... Uh, and connect with you online for a copy of your book. Uh, thanks so much, Ken. Okay, great talking to you, John. Have a great rest of your day. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please go to geekleader.com to learn more about what this guest is up to, click on their links, and connect with them online. I would also greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show. Make sure you subscribe subscribed if you haven't already. And if you feel so inclined, you can leave me a tip by going to geekleader.com slash tip.